Hi, and welcome to Worship with Portage United Church of Christ here in Portage, Michigan. This is worship for the week of March 19th, 2023, the fourth Sunday of Lent. I am the Reverend Mary Kay Schooneman, the senior pastor here at PUCC, and I am delighted to welcome you to our online worship this week. I'm also really excited to introduce to you our new pastor here at PUCC, our associate pastor, who you will be hearing preach today, the Reverend Mac Kneebone. So I've asked him to come on up so you can see him and meet him. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm looking forward to sharing with you all, and I'm really glad to be here at PUCC and to be ministering with Reverend Mary Kay. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank you, Mac. This week, our theme is risking rejection, and we're going to hear the story of someone who took such a risk in order to show extravagant love to Jesus. We don't always think of the risk involved when we become followers of Jesus, when we show the world our love for his passion, which was creating the kingdom of God. Today, we're going to rethink the risk involved as we share his passion and this extravagant love. So I invite you to settle in wherever you are, whatever day of the week it is that you are joining us. Feel God's presence within and around you, and let us prepare our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our spirits for worship. We continue on our journey through Lent as we step inside the story full of difficult moments. We put ourselves in the picture of Holy Week so that we might take a closer look and let the ancient story open us to deeper love for Jesus. Enter the story, enter the place you belong, not just looking on, for this is your story, enter the story. Besides the Last Supper, Holy Week contains another important story that happens at dinner. Earlier in the week, Jesus and his followers gather for a meal, and a woman shows up unexpectedly to anoint Jesus in an extravagant show of devotion. To say she caused quite a stir might be understating it a bit. We imagine ourselves in the room, and we see the looks of judgment and even outrage on the faces around us. Are we ourselves moved by her generosity and outpouring of emotion? Or are we uncomfortable as Jesus refers to his own death? Does our complaining or anger really serve to hide our own fear? Jesus invites us to tell this story 
in remembrance of her. What uncomfortable stories are we called to tell in our time? Just looking on For this is our passion Enter the passion Enter Enter the passion Enter the place we belong not just looking on for this is our passion enter the passion enter the story enter the passion Enter his passion. It is so hard to not be afraid. Sometimes our fear makes us less compassionate and more judgmental. We think we can ward off getting hurt by holding back, unwilling to risk putting ourselves out there for the sake of love. Forgive us, O oh God. Encourage us to extravagant acts of love, especially when we are afraid. You entered our story through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Know this, my friends, there is no limit on love. Love does not run out. You can start giving more of it at any time. You are loved and forgiven, freed and encouraged by a God who wants you to live fully. Let us enter the passion of Christ together. This reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses three through nine. Jesus was at Bethany, visiting the house of Simon, who had a skin disease. During dinner, a woman came in with a vase made of alabaster and containing very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke open the vase and poured the perfume on his head. 
Some grew angry. They said to each other, why waste the perfume? This perfume could have been sold for almost a year's pay and the money given to the poor, and they scolded her. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. You always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do something good for them. But you won't always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body ahead of time for burial. I tell you the truth that wherever in the whole world the good news is announced, what she's done will always be told in memory of her. The story of the woman with the alabaster jar appears in all four Gospels. Usually that means that it was such an extraordinary moment that no one would forget. Not only that, Jesus makes a point to instruct those present to remember this woman. Alongside this story today, let us hear the psalmist who also speaks of extravagant love and presence in the midst of the valley of the shadows of death. The tradition of anointing with oil goes back a long way. And in Psalm 23, the image of being bathed in oil is set at a table on which an overflowing cup symbolizes the kind of love we are to emulate as children of God and disciples of Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. God lets me rest in grassy meadows and leads me to restful waters to keep me alive. God guides me in proper paths for the sake of their good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. None of us around the table liked the way things were going here in Jerusalem. The conversation had turned once again to the dire situation for many of the people we had encountered. Those who were hungry, poor, sick, disturbed, but does the Roman state care about them? No, at least we try. Every penny we can scrape up, we try to pass on to those who need it. I had to wonder though, whether the talk of asking our patrons for more money right now was really because we were afraid. Before Jesus arrived to dinner that night, some of the disciples had said, with the way things are going, perhaps we should be saving money in case we needed to hide out in the not too distant future. And then she walked in. I saw the jar she carried. Oh, beautiful alabaster. And as soon as I smelled the oil as she began to anoint Jesus, I knew it was nard and it had been expensive. And there was a lot of it. Across the table, the others were beginning to stop their conversations and looks of contempt began to cross their faces. Mumbling began. Do you know how much that kind of oil costs? It seems a ridiculous waste given what we have just been talking about. That kind of money could go a long way. 
I looked down at her. I was close, and although she had not said a word, I could sense her intensity and devotion. This love lavished on him was somewhat embarrassing, and yet it was what I really wanted to do. Tell him how he had changed my life and how finally I felt I had purpose in my life. I felt loved, and oh, it was such a gift. But how can you offer any gift to this beloved one? He is the anointed one, anointed by God. But here she is anointing him. I realized that what I felt was jealousy mixed with a deep fear that we were losing him. I think we all are afraid of losing him. He tells us to stop judging her. She is preparing me for burial. No, I thought, don't say that. It can't happen. Later, I will remember her, just as he has, had asked me to do. And I will remember that he asked us to care for all people the way she cared for him that night. It was mentioned that all four Gospels tell the story of a woman who anoints Jesus with expensive perfume. In two of them, in Mark, which we read, and in Matthew, this story is placed in Bethany at the home of a guy named Simon. Both of these tellings mention that Simon had a skin disease, and we tend to assume that Jesus had at one time healed him, and he became a follower. The woman who anointed him is, well, she's simply that, a woman, an unnamed woman who loves Jesus dearly. In the Gospel of Luke, the telling is placed at the home of a Pharisee, and the woman there in that story is labeled as a sinner. We're told that the Pharisee's name is Simon, the same name that we hear the writers of Matthew and Mark call him, but a very different person. The woman's name, once again, we don't know. The writer of John places the story in Bethany, like in Matthew and in Mark, but... In this telling, Jesus is at the home of his friends, of Lazarus, Martha, Mary. These three siblings were like family to him. In this story, it's Mary of Bethany, the sister friend of Jesus, who anoints him with expensive perfume. Even though there are differences in the details from each writer, the structure is the same. Jesus was having a meal with people. At some point in the evening, a woman comes in and, and opens a jar of costly perfume, precious ointment, to lavish upon him in a public display of love and of care. She is resoundingly criticized by one or more of the men sitting around, and Jesus defends her unabashedly and without reserve. We don't know if the woman who anointed Jesus, whether it was Mary of Bethany or some random follower of Jesus, we don't know if she had a lot of money. Maybe she had just barely enough to scrape by. We don't know if the nard she anointed Jesus with was specifically bought for this occasion. She had this idea, and she said, I must do something, scrape together all the money she possibly could and bought this nard just for this moment. We don't know if maybe she had been saving her whole life to buy this nard and it was held in a special place in her house for maybe some day where she wanted to use it or to sell it, but it was just her life saving and this was a great sacrifice that she made just for this moment and said, no, I need to use it now. Or we don't know if maybe she had five jars of the stuff at her house because she was so wealthy. <laughs> The story doesn't tell us that about her. Was she a servant? 
how did she get in the room? Was she kind of invisible, like, like servants are? You know, you don't pay attention to them. I don't know if any of you watch television shows where there's an aristocratic family and then you've got the people that are walking around tending to them and actually the people who are walking around tending to them know all the secrets because nobody cares. They don't think that they're significant at all. They're the ones with the real knowledge. They invisibly float through the room. Was she that person? Or... Was she one of the patrons of Jesus that subsidized his ministry? And when she walked into the room and the men saw her and they went, I am not saying anything. <laughs> she is way too powerful for me to confront. Except when she started to act and then what did they do? They whispered to themselves, what are you doing? This version of the story doesn't tell us much about this woman. What we do know is that she decided Jesus and her relationship with him was worth the cost of this precious ointment. We also know that she wasn't afraid to make a grand gesture toward him in front of others. You know what? That's wrong. That's not right at all. We don't know what she was feeling. <clears throat> We don't, we don't actually know if she was afraid. What we know is that if she was afraid, she didn't let it consume her and stop her. She might have been shaken in her soul. She might have been fully confident. This woman and the story about her, Jesus said, will be remembered as long as the good news is told. She is a part of the good news that he is telling. She is an agent of good news. Even as she anoints him ahead of time for his death, this woman whose name we don't know and whose story we tell over and over took a risk that night that her gesture, that her gift would be criticized. She took a risk that what she was doing and even who she was might be rejected by Jesus. Her passion, her devotion, her love moved her to take that risk. And according to all four stories, she was criticized, but not by Jesus. Her gift was rejected by those present at the dinner gathering. She was rejected by them. They declared offense at her careless use of resources saying that they could have used that money to give to the poor. Well, this is a real distraction to the problem. We don't ever see Jesus and his disciples walking around handing out money. Her critics were offended, but they were offended by her devotion. They were offended by the way she loved him, right in front of them. They were offended because Jesus responded to her with openness and gratitude and appreciation. They were jealous of the relationship and the bond that was being created right there in that moment, right in front of them, and they could do nothing about it, and they weren't in it. She gave Jesus something that either they couldn't or they wouldn't. It wasn't about the preciousness of the perfume. It wasn't about the cost of it. She gave Jesus her attention and her understanding. The lavishness of that tangible gift was symbolic of the preciousness and the costliness of her devotion to him. She didn't just give him the jar of nard. Here, Jesus, this is something I want you to have. This is really important to me, and I want you to know how special you are here is a gift. No, she didn't do that. What did she do? She took that jar she broke the seal of it open. That seal could never be put back together. And then she poured out the nard in her hands and she anointed him with it. And it ran all down him. She broke the barrier between teacher and student, between gender roles of the time, between what might be done in private and what might be done in public? Even more than that, he embraced and celebrated what she was doing. 
he helped her create a more sacred and holy moment than she probably had anticipated. She gave the gift she had, the one that she felt best fit the depth of the occasion. And she might have worried that she'd be perceived as going over the top, making a spectacle of herself, and she was perceived that way by the gathered. She wasn't wrong about them. She wasn't wrong about him either, about Jesus. She knew that who she was and what she had to give wasn't wasted on him. It makes me wonder about the gifts that each of us have to give, gifts we have to give to each other, to our community, gifts we have to give to God. In what ways do we hold back, either because we're afraid that our gift isn't good enough or maybe ah, we're afraid that we're too much, that it's too, too over the top, that people will think that we're showing off. Maybe we're afraid God will think that we're showing off. Well, if the psalmist is right, God is all about going over the top. In front of our enemy, God says, I anoint you with something overflowing. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. And it's, it's not going to be able to be withheld, to be stopped, to be shored up. It's an overflowing cup of love and acceptance and celebration for who we are. And in like manner, this woman did the same for Jesus. It might not exactly have been in front of Jesus' enemies, although it depends on which gospel version we're talking about. But it certainly was in front of some of her enemies. She demonstrated her love and her devotion in front of her enemies to Jesus. And then what happened? In front of her enemies, Jesus blessed her and declared her story to be told whenever the good news is shared. The, the gift that you have to offer might not be a public one. We like to compare ourselves and see, you know, who, who are we in that frame? And we think, well, I'm, I could never do that. Well, maybe that's not exactly what you're called to do. Your gift might not be demonstrative. Yeah, and you might not even think it's lavish. Don't let that stop you. When we think about the pure nard, uh, at least in part, as being symbolic of her devotion, any gift that we have can be considered lavish. Any gift that we give with a full heart and an intention of deep connection can be lavish. The connection we seek might be with our divine beloved. It might be with, with people. It might be with any part of creation, actually. It's our intention that makes the gift special and that makes the moment real. An intention like that can be risky. It means that no matter what we're offering, we're giving it with our full selves. There's, there's a vulnerability to that, one that opens us up to something beautiful and takes us to the next level of what it means to love of what it means to be loved. It's the kind of thing that some people might criticize. That can be scary. The, the woman who anointed Jesus knew the risks. I imagine her weighing the pros and cons, wondering who's going to be there at the dinner. Can I bear their looks, their criticism? Or maybe, maybe what happened was she heard about the dinner. She knew what Jesus had been talking about, his death. And she said, I've got to do this. And it was an impulsive act. And in the middle of her anointing Jesus, she was like, well, what am I doing? Have you ever had one of those moments? And, and you say to yourself, well, if I stop now, <laughs> that's just not going to work. So you plunge through and you finish it. And at the end of it, you either feel triumphant and amazing, and you're like, I think I'm going to lay down now. <laughs> she kept on until she was finished. And because she anointed him, she instigated a bond between them, and he reciprocated. What is the risk that your heart is tugging you toward? 
What is the bond you wonder about instigating? Isn't that a great word? Instigating. How is your spirit moving you in this season? There's a little bit of celebration there. <laughs> you know, whenever something like that happens, it's just an amen. <laughs> how is your spirit moving you in this season, and how is the spirit moving us as a community in this season? I believe this story teaches us the good news that when we act with full hearts and loving intentions, holy love and grace itself accepts our offering, celebrates us, embraces the moment that we're creating. Sure, there's going to be detractors. There's always going to be detractors, critics. It seems like anything really important that we do comes with a risk, but I believe that love is worth the risk. What is tugging at your heart and spirit? How do you want to bring more love into the world? Who or what do you want to anoint? Well, I can't anoint anybody. Yes, you can. Please do. Let us receive the good news of, that this woman has to offer as an invitation for us to be an agent of anointing. Your gift will be received and celebrated by holy love in remembrance of her. And with that, my friends, peace. We remember today the extravagant love shown to Jesus and his invitation to remember this woman through our actions of loving others. For when we experience the valley of the shadow of death, we are called to be with one another. We remember today those who tend to the sick and dying caregivers, medical professionals, hospice workers, and humanitarians who risk leaving home and even enter dangerous places just to help others. And now, let us call to our mind's eye, perhaps with eyes closed, if you are comfortable doing that, those people in our lives who need our advocacy presence, and prayers. I invite you to lift aloud names or places that you would add to our prayers today. And now would you join with me the Lord's Prayer. Our God, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this week. Please continue to worship with us throughout Lent and into the worship season, because this is a very important time in the life of the church, and we look forward to being a part of your connection with the body of Christ and your own personal growth in your journey of faith. Also, remember, if you would like to support our ministry and mission here at PUCC or make a contribution to the One Great Hour of Sharing, please go to our website and click the Donate button where you'll be able to make a contribution to support our ministry or support this special offering. As you go into this week, my friends, I leave you with these words of benediction. 
May you awaken each day to the poignant beauty the divine artist creates in our stories and the stories around us. May the life and teaching and risk-taking of Jesus be the frame of your daily living. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, may our lives be transformed as we take the risk to dwell in the story of Jesus' passion. Amen.